so welcome to another video from theplayersaid.com. My name's Alexander, and today we're uh, doing another episode of From Cover to Cover. Uh, this is, uh, if you don't know, this is a series that just kind of, uh, to my whim, uh, is book reviews, and typically they're historical or military-based books. And we talk about the book and kind of a little bit of a, kind of a, a review or overview of what the book might be if that might be something you're interested in reading, but also, uh, for something you have read, uh, some war games that correspond to the topics that are covered in that book. And so, it's a way to kind of tie two of my favorite hobbies together, and maybe just kind of expand upon some of the things that, oh, I've played a game, uh, but I finally read a book about it to learn a bit more knowledge, or the other way around, or I've read this amazing book, I've sought out a game that covers that topic, this is what that game provided in relation to maybe some of the things that I'd learned. So, if you appreciate everyone who's tuning in for these things, I know it's not necessarily the kind of thing that we typically cover on this, but, you know, a little pet project of mine, so that's what you're getting. So today, well, <laughs> after the ramble, uh, today uh, talking about a book called Three Days in June. And this is a book that was put together by James O'Connell, and um, this is a, a brand new book, at least uh, new to me. So this actually was released uh, in June of 2022, uh, and it was part of the 40th anniversary of the Battle of Mount Longdon. And so, uh, three days in June, this covers um, three powers battle at Mount Longdon uh, in like the last, uh, their last offensive action during the Falklands. So, uh, if this might, if there's something that you've never read anything about the Falklands, um, this is a very specific um, kind of ground battle that happened in that. You don't get a lot of operational overview or an overview of, of the whole campaign as such. Um, that does exist. There's plenty of books out there. Um, there's also some great documentaries out there that kind of give you an overview of that. So that, that and those are available like free on YouTube, um, things like that. But you get like <laughs> two or three pages of like it was the Falklands kind of a thing is, is like a little primer intro, and then it is almost immediately kind of into the action. So the book itself ha is basically entirely um, first-hand accounts and recounts of the action um, from the people who were there, boots on the ground, from, you know, the lowest kind of level privates all the way up to, I think they've got uh, some email correspondence and s some notes from his own book from the, the Brigadier, was it Julian Thomas? I don't know if I'm remembering his name properly, but like up to the Brigadier level and kind of everywhere in between. And so it's a very visceral book. Uh, it is a very uh, brutal book, at times very harrowing, a very intense book, because uh, it, it is, you know, former military guys who were there, and very little of it is sugar-coated. And it is a an excellent uh, window into the kind of um, metal uh, and the kind of emotion that prevails on a battlefield, the kind of courage and professionalism, but also the uh, the, the interpersonal relationships, uh, the the tragedy, the despair. Uh, it, it's all in here. It's a fascinating, fascinating read. Um, again, it all being kind of first-hand recounts is very intense, and the organization of the book is one of the things that was very interesting to me. So, this book was recommended to me by my brother. Um, he's, uh, you know, six years older than me, I believe. It's probably older than that. I should know my own brother's age, but I don't. Uh, and he said it was extremely good, very intense, and he wanted someone to talk to about it. And it's the kind of thing that you would, we would have talked to our father, but uh, unfortunately, uh, he d died two years ago. And so, he's, he's ex-military, um, he was in the army for 13 years. During this time, he didn't fight in the Falklands. He, um, at the time, uh, we were stationed in Germany. Uh, he was in Northern Ireland, though, uh, for six months. And so he knew a lot of the people who had fought in the Falklands. And, you know, even talking to my mother, 
she remembers, you know, you'd go to all these kind of dinners on the army bases and there'd be like the table of the Falklands veterans, you know, years and years afterwards kind of getting together and like sharing stories and supporting each other, you know. So it's something that I'm close to, but not as close as other people out there. A lot of people who are my age um, and a little bit older, their parents or their, their fathers fought in the Falklands. So it was something that was very um, prevalent, is what I would say. So anyway, this was recommended to me, and I was like, we'll just do it. Didn't really know what I was kind of getting myself into, uh, but if you've read anything by um, Stephen Ambrose, uh, where it's a lot of the first-hand recountings, imagine that. Uh, but without, like, the World War II sense of, like, censorship and sensibility, this is an extremely harsh and visceral book at times. Um, it doesn't pull its punches, uh, and I appreciate that, that it was, a, I think it's a very honest book. So, the way that it's laid out, and I alluded to that earlier, uh, is very interesting. So, um, Three Power is made up of um, four companies. There is, um, there might be five. So there's HQ Company, there's A, B, and C Company, and then um, then there's, I think, Support Company. But I think that might be part of HQ, but I'm not, I can't remember. But uh, basically, it goes through the battle chronologically um, from the, you know, Friday night into Saturday, all the way to the Monday, like when, you know, at which point, you know, the Argentines have surrendered and they're just like, after the battle, they they kind of walk into Port Stanley. So you get that kind of three day arc and then it's told from the point of, you know, uh, B Company. And so B Company is one of the main assaulting forces uh, across this big mountainous feature that's dug in with, um, uh, I think it's seventh infantry rifles uh, for, of the Argentinians, and they're going from east to west across this very long um, terrain feature, all rocky, big mountain, very very harsh conditions, and so they're like kind of the main assault force, and it's very intense. So from their standpoint, from B Company's standpoint, which is the first section of the book, it's actually told from. Um, Four platoon, five platoon, and six platoon. Um, so you you get the battle start to finish from four platoon, start to finish from five platoon, start to finish from six platoon. Although it's not in that order, I think it's six five four is the way they do it, and they do that because it helps to build some of the tension and some of the things that happen uh, in the progression of the battle, which is very intense. We'll talk about a little bit. So you get through that, and it's so the story is oh, intense, and then it kind of settles off, or very intense, and settles off, and, and so the the book is. <laughs> constantly throwing you back into this and easing off. And then we're done with that, and then it cuts to uh, A Company, who were, uh, they were kind of assaulting in a second wave, but they were coming from the north of the mountain, and they were holding a line, and all sorts of things happen. And so then you get the story from them, all the pretty battle, then the whole battle, and then the couple of days afterwards where they were shelled very heavily, and then them kind of marching off into Port Stanley. and then. And then you get HQ Company and you get C Company, who were the holding reserve, but who were then tasked with uh, supporting two para as they were going to go and have to assault Wireless Ridge. All this stuff that's going on. And then you get all the support companies. So the support companies, so you've got things like the all of the heavy machine gun teams. Some of them are attached to different platoons, others are not. The mortar platoon. Um, and it's so you get, and again, it's the story of all these different uh, teams of people across that. So the book is a, a roller coaster of the same story over and over again from different standpoints. And uh, what was really very interesting, very cool, frankly, about the book is that you'd get something would happen. And it was like, oh, and we all heard this explosion and then this scream, and it, <laughs> which is awful. But you, you wouldn't know specifically what it was until later on in the book when that happened within that particular platoon or that particular company. It was like, oh, that was this thing. And so it, it, it shows the, a lot of the fog of war, which I thought was fascinating from a first person perspective. I thought that was a really, really cool aspect to this book of the things that it showed. And so you'd have 
you know, people would be nearby something and something would kind of happen over there, but they couldn't leave their post, so they weren't really, really sure what happened. Or later on in the book, the people who that happened to, it was their recounts of that action. And, and so you, you had like, here's the story from, from this view, and then you get it from this view, and then from this view, and it paints this whole picture overall, and it was a really, really, um, it was a great way of writing the book, um, and to help, to help it stop, it meant that you could focus on the individuals in the story, because you weren't overloaded with a mass of kind of players, so to speak. Because if you'd had to remember every single person in the, in the battalion, that's a lot to, to kind of keep a hold of as you kind of, if you did the whole thing chronologically. Instead you've got, okay, we're doing four platoon B company, great. We're gonna talk about these kind of 15 or 20 people who were able to be interviewed for this. And you can kind of get to know them a bit more and kind of really get that cemented. Then you can move on to this other bit. And then a couple people might uh, kind of cross over into this story because they were tasked to go and pick up some wounded or they met some people, but you're focusing on these characters. And then the same thing, oh, well now we're focusing on HQ Company. Well, I've heard some of those names previously as they popped up in this story, but this is them being a bit more focused so you can really get to know them a bit more. So that was a really interesting way of doing it. I thought that was really neat. Um, and overall, I had uh, a very good time reading this. It was, it was very interesting. This is um, some of, I don't know if I'd heard of this specific battle um, per se, or the co combat, this action, um, but I'd heard about the, the, the actions in and around uh, Port Stanley on these kind of mountains and ridges. And it was, it's often said that it's like, oh, the Falklands was kind of a pushover with this very professional army, uh, with kind of overwhelming um, force and, you know, training versus effectively what was a, a significant amount of conscripts uh, on the island. And it was kind of like, oh, it was an inevitable kind of a thing. And there's the famous uh, newspaper title of The Empire Strikes Back and all that. But, it, you know, you can say, oh, it was, it was kind of a foregone conclusion. And whilst that may have been the case, you still had to have the underground boots, underground courage and bravery and professionalism uh, to, to kind of push that through, and it wasn't without, you know, heavy casualties, which you'll read about in this book, and it's very intense. It can be quite draining at times. Uh, it, it, like, it's not like they pull any punches. It's very sad at times, this book is, where you've got friends seeing other friends, you know, in the regimental aid post, and th there's some really uh, very tragic and heartfelt moments in this book um, that, that uh, it's a, a very, well, <laughs> it's hard to put that into words, what that's like. I do recommend that you read it from that standpoint. But this is, but all that to say that, you know, I had heard that th th these were some of the most vicious and bloody engagements in some of the more modern conflicts, at least at that time, because when they were fighting in the dark amongst these rocks, in and around different uh, bunkers and trenches, it's hand-to-hand -hand at times. Like, hand-to-hand -hand stuff, or you were shooting people, you know, five meters away, two meters away, throwing a grenade in and jumping in afterwards. It's that kind of actions before the age of, you know, satellites and drones and all the kind of stuff that we have now in modern conflict, some, some of the actions that take place feels a little bit World War I, uh, which is, it's just fascinating to, to see that uh, at this level at this time period. So I couldn't recommend this highly enough. It's a very good, very intense read. Um, I, this took me about, I don't know, 10 to 15 days to read. No, that's not true. It was more than that. It's more like 15 to 20 days to read. It took me about two and a half weeks reading on and off. Um, it's a it's a good 450 pages, uh, and there's some like notes in the back with some of the uh, um, the honor rolls of uh, all of the all of the deceased, the awards that were given on both sides. Um, there's some you know indices and different bits and pieces. Uh, which was very helpful as well. But there's some good pictures and annotated maps of the actual feature of Mount Longdon with all the different notations of, hey, 
this was the start line. Uh, this ridge was codenamed um, Fly Half. Uh, that kind of uh, depression over there was codenamed Fullback. That's where the enemy HQ was. That was the ultimate goal. Uh, so it's got it's got some good diagrams. I kind of wish it had a few more. Um, just just would have helped. I think a little bit, but because I re I referred back to those a good number of times. But generally speaking, this was a very good book. So we've talked about this a little bit what Falklands War Games are there out there. There's a ton. Um, I haven't played all of them. I have played a few, and so I'd just like to talk about some of the ones that I have played. So, the, the big one, uh, and this is, gets talked about a lot, is where there is Discord. Now, where there is Discord is a, is a very large strategic look at the Falklands. Um, mostly you're involved in, like, a significant portion of the game is getting there and landing the troops. And after that, it's, it becomes this slightly little kind of a mini-game where you kind of do the little ground, uh, ground forces. So this is an extremely large out-of-print game. This is a solitaire game. I actually did a full review of this years ago. I enjoyed this game uh, for what it is, uh, but this is mo the major focus on this is getting your task force with your aircraft carriers and your troop ships and all of your support vessels down to the Falklands safely. You will spend most of the game doing that. Uh, and it's doing that's very cool, managing your Harriers and setting up the different air zones and all this stuff is awesome. This game's out of print. It was kind of uh, done by a company called Fifth Column Games that was an independent company. Uh, it's a little bit unwieldy. The rulebook's not brilliant, and it was in desperate need of a developer, but getting a hold of this on a second-hand market is quite difficult. It's very expensive because it's just not in print and probably won't ever be again. I hope that someone is able to pry it from somewhere and do something with it, because if you could give this a facelift, uh, it would be very good. Uh, but this is kind of a much grander look at the Falklands. Uh, you don't necessarily get into quite the same level of nitty-gritty that you would that's described in the book. Um, but basically, you've got this little San Carlos display. You, you, you fly all your stuff down there, and then when you get there, you do your little troop ships and your landings, and then it's kind of over with. Uh, you don't get into the, re the real ground combat stuff, which is a shame, but that's just not what the focus of the game is. It's good. Um, it's not perfect uh, by any stretch of the imagination. It's very enjoyable, but um, a little bit warts and all. Maybe that's the, the least... Uh, in connection with the game, but th that's a, a really interesting game nonetheless, is what I would say. Uh, one game that I have played very recently, another solitaire war game, is Mrs. Thatcher's War. Uh, this is from Ben Madison, put out by White Dog Games. Uh, so this is, everyone's kind of arrived at the Falklands, you kind of go, technically you've got Ascension Island and you've got the total exclusion zone around the Falklands, but uh, again, there's a full review of this that's either out or it's coming soon. I'm not quite sure about the timing on this one. Uh, but you do have to do all of that defense, uh, the air defense, getting your Harriers out to defend against uh, the, uh, the Argentine Air Forces. But you, this is, you have a map of, of the East Falklands and you have to move your forces on three different tracks to get to Port Stanley. And when you encounter resistance, you have to fight them. You have to fight for air superiority to be able to keep everyone in supply to move them. That also gives you a modifier in combat. And Mount Longdon is one of the spaces on one of the tracks. So <laughs> it's, it's one little piece of this larger puzzle. Uh, but this game was very enjoyable, extremely difficult, uh, and I would recommend this very heartily. Um, you, you get kind of a... Again, this is a, a much larger overall picture. Uh, this is a, it is a big strategic game. You, you know, three para is one counter, and it'll be in a stack with two or three other counters, and they'll move on to Mount Longdon, and you'll probably do a combat there. But uh, that's Mrs. Thatcher's War. This was a, a very good, you know, this is a really nice solitaire game because it's not too flimsy, but not too beefy. Uh, it's, it's a really nice middle ground. This takes, you know, two to three hours to play because uh, you've got to play it to the end. I don't think it's possible to lose before then. But, you know, things could go horrendously and it's very obvious and you could call it. But um, you're going to play through this whole thing uh, and this gives you a really good overview of, generally speaking, what things were like uh, from, from an from a overall command standpoint. 
I thought that was, that was a good one. So the last game that we want to talk about is uh, a Lock and Load Tactical Heroes of the Falklands. So this is a tactical level game. Your counters are uh, men or little uh, squads of guys that make up sections. Uh, you'll have a counter for an individual harrier. You'll have uh, offshore bombardment. I think it's from HMS. Well, that now, that now I'm gonna no. We're, we're not gonna guess. I forget what it is, but I remember there's a counter that's it's three counters that make up a ship that you put in three hexes. It's really cool, um, and that's offshore of uh, Port Stanley as part of the naval gun line, I believe. Uh, so this game, part of their lock and load tactical system. If you've not played it, this is a pretty crunchy, a pretty intense tactical system. Um, but they have all loads, the variety, and it's great. This is one of my favorite titles in the series because I feel like thematically it offers something different from a lot of other tactical series out there. So many tactical war games are World War II, whereas Lock and Load Tactical is great because they have this, they have Soviet-Afghan war, they got all sorts of other different modern bits and pieces, so you, you can do more with the system, and this is a really enjoyable game. And in this, uh, th this battle has what is one of the scenarios in here. And it's not even the whole battle, it's just fighting up and securing um, Fly Half, which is like the initial ridge at the top of the eastern slope, basically. You have to climb this mountain with your guys, and you have to fight everyone off of that and secure the area. And it, <laughs> this is a game that is very bloody and very brutal, and it's very challenging, the terrain's awful, it's a nighttime scenario, so your visibility's awful, so spotting people is almost impossible, there's almost zero support. Uh, but this battle is very explicitly in there, so if you want to play Mount Longdon, you can do that at a tactical level with your different units, uh, you know, climbing the mountain and securing the mountain, you can do that with this. Um, I really enjoyed this game, um, it's a series Again, I think this is one of my favorite in this series, is what I would say. Um, I have played this also with the Lock and Load solo module, which is a lot of flow charts to make the Argentines kind of do what they're supposed to do. Works pretty well, all things considered. Um, but if you want to play something, you know, down to a man, you can do that with this game as well. So that's kind of all of the... I've just played, I think, the three Falklands games. If there's any others out there, Please put them in the comments and let me know uh, what I should maybe look at next. It's a fascinating conflict, um, and it's, you know, it, this book, I believe, sheds a lot of light on what it was like to be on the ground in the conditions that they were in, you know, Southern Hemisphere, middle of winter, all that kind of stuff. But also, you know, there's elements of the the... There's a little bit of reflection from, from some of the soldiers towards the end of the book as well. And I think some of those uh, insights and thoughts are very, very interesting. And I also really liked that this isn't just about combat. I mean, there is a whole section about all of the, the medical teams and all of the evacuation uh, personnel. Uh, for those, so like at the end, you you know you've all this combat stuff, and you've heard about all these people being casualties, and they're taken back to the regimental aid post. And then the last section of the book is about uh, is it Padre Derek Heaver, I think, like the 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 battalion chaplain, and then uh, the battalion doctors and a number of the different medics at the regimental aid post saving lives, uh, organizing prisoners, and then trying to get everyone Casavac, and then you'll get bits from the pilots of the helicopters, the various Wessex and Gazelle helicopters flying in. So you also get more than just the combat, which I thought was a real um, uh, gem in this book. And I would like to wrap up by saying that this book, written by, it's written by James O'Connell, who fought in this battle, and you will see what happens to him, but spoiler alert, uh, it's, it's, <laughs> He's not someone who's shied away uh, from trying to get some things done. Uh, part of this is uh, he's been trying to get, is it, I think it's uh, Steve McLaughlin, um, a posthumous award for a very long time for his bravery, and when you read about this you'll understand why. 
um, that, that that's deserved, I believe. But this is um, James O'Connell really trying to tell the stories of the people that he was with, was very heavily influenced by, and what they went through. And so the book itself is, um, is a great tribute to his friends, his colleagues, his compatriots, uh, and his fellow servicemen, and as such, I don't know, there's a, there's a real air of um, respect in the book, and the, the parts where he is kind of telling his own story is just fascinating as well. Um, so please check this out if this is something you're interested in. I had a very, very, it's a very intense read, I, there were times where I couldn't put it down. <laughs> there was times where I wanted to put it down uh, because it was like, "Whew, I'll take a break." It was it was a lot, um, but a great book um, and one of one of the few books on kind of modern conflict that I think I've read. A lot of my books that I've read are on you know World War Two or even further back, Napoleonic's things like that. So it was interesting to read something that was a bit more modern and a bit more something where I kind of knew a little bit more about the equipment that was being used. Like when I talk about a gazelle, I immediately know what that looks like. When I talk about a Wessex, I know immediately what that looks like. I have a 156 scale Wessex that I built and painted in a cabinet right behind the camera that you can't see. So like, and it's painted in the Falkland scheme uh, of all the ones that came in the box. So like, th there, there are these things where I have more of a familiarity with this and with um, some other things that happened. So it was a uh, much more visceral read than some of the other history books that I've read. So anyway, Three Days in June by James O'Connell. Check it out if there's something you're interested in. Uh, hopefully this may inspire you to play some of these war games, or if you played some of those war games, to maybe pick up a book and read about some of the things that happened. But yeah, if there's other books on the Falklands that you'd recommend, if there's any games on the Falklands that you recommend, leave them in the comments. But either way, I appreciate you very much for tuning in. I've been Alexander from theplayersaid.com.